Welcome to the Local History Center located here at the Peninsula Center Library. Uh, my name is Monique Sugimoto and I am the archivist and local history librarian here with the Palos Verdes Library District. And um, this is Michelle Fricke. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> um, today uh, we just wanted to start out first by telling you a little bit about ourselves and how we got here um, to the library. Um, I am, uh, I've been with the library since 2012. Um, I've been an archivist here prior to this job. I was an archivist with the National Archives and Records Administration out in Riverside County. Um, and prior to that, I was an archivist with UCLA. Um, it's, uh, it's been a very fun career, but uh, certainly as a resident, being able to document your own community is probably one of the most rewarding jobs that I can, that I can say I've ever had. Michelle? And I formerly was at Capital Group as a corporate archivist and retired, and now have the opportunity to be here, and um, I'm very excited about um, doing research and helping the patrons with, with, with what we have here. And Michelle um, just um, started here with the Local History Center in December of last year, and she is our newest archivist, and it's wonderful to have her um, on board. And for that, we really have our previous Local History uh, Center librarian, Marjean Blinn, to thank for that. Um, she wanted to continue the work and saw um, the value of having this type of um, center here with the library, and she is actually funding of the position, so we are very thankful for her to, uh, to be able to allow us to continue doing this work. And personally, it's wonderful to have another archivist on board, uh, another partner in crime, just allowing us to really fulfill the mission of the Local History Center, which is to preserve and share the history of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. So the project that we're working on now actually is this donation of this photograph. It's a photograph that was taken in 1934 about, and we call it the Totodi Prefecture luncheon. Um, and Totori Prefecture is actually an area of Japan and it is um, the people that are in the photograph are said to be either from Totori or descendants from people who are uh, who came from the Totori Prefecture. And the photograph itself is actually a subset of a photograph that we have here in the local history center um, that was taken in 1923 and we call it our 40 families photograph. Um, and that is a photograph that captures um, all of the Japanese farmers, or a good set of the Japanese farmers who were farming here on the peninsula, um, starting in about the 1910s, 19-teens time period. And this photograph, um, what we're doing with it now is we're trying to identify everybody who is in the photograph, just as we've done with the 40 families photograph. And to do that, what we do is we actually um, made a little uh, cutout of the photograph and we gave everybody a number. And we go through different materials and we try to identify them. Now, what's been really helpful is the 40 families photograph because we can identify some people who are similar and we already have um, a way to identify them. We see who they are and then we can write their, write their names in um, on, the, uh, on our documentation. Um, but how we do that is we request files, um, we uh, are looking at old yearbooks, um, we try to get materials um, not only from the yearbooks, from, from immigration records, and we also we have this one immigration record of, from somebody named Akiyoshi because we were trying to figure out who, who that was. And what's interesting of, of, in this particular item is that the, um, it, it's included in some immigration and naturalization records um, as a Chinese case file when in fact the people are Japanese um, in the photograph, but that is one way that we can look and see if we can identify the people um, from these photographs in various documentation that are in our Totori Prefecture photograph. You know, as I'm learning all the resources that we have in the local history center, you were showing me these uh, the physical year, yearbooks, and you want to talk sure. a little bit about them? Um, 
So not many people will realize the importance of having a directory or some type of, like our telephone directories. These are probably one of the most valuable resources um, that we have when we're conducting um, original research into, into um, you know, whatever topic we are researching. This is actually the 19, um, uh, it's a telephone directory uh, called the Los Angeles Japanese Daily News, the yearbook and directory. And it includes, um, you know, a directory. It's all in Japanese. There are there is some English in here, but it includes photographs. But it includes the farmers, the businesses that were here, and we're able to look through these directories um, and identify who might be here. We found for this particular one, um, I actually found a 1921 um, telephone directory. Um, again, in Japanese, and it lists the farmers um, based in the areas of Southern California. So that is another huge resource for us to take a look through, uh, to take a look through that, and we can identify um, the names of people from those different resources. And I think yeah. it's just absolutely incredible that you could find a 1921 um, directory um, and you were telling me that it was in the Hadi Trust, Trust and right. so you know it's not necessarily something that we have in the room but because we know the, of the resources that we have here you were able to find it and and then be able to translate the names and figure out uh, where people are living or can That's, you kind of give a little bit more sure. what you're, we were talking about? Yeah so you know, as, as everything is turning digital, or a lot of resources are becoming digitized, um, there is a website that we often use in archives called Hathi Trust. So it's a, a, hathitrust.org. Um, and it is digitized materials that are already out of copyright. So they are, they're available for us to use. Um, and you can't just go in there and say, you know, find me Japanese directories. I actually found the 1921 directory um, by using the Romanized title of the directory. So I was able, to, you know, I'm not using, you know, Japanese directory, but Nihongo are finding what that term is. Um, and I was able to find the directory. And um, th that has been um, really interesting to be able to access those resources online. So the combination of records that we can request from you know it, the naturalization yeah. or the archives um, uh, physical book resources like we have over here or digitized electronic resources um, yearbook photographs like that is actually one of the things that we have um, we have this is a a family uh, a family photograph um, of this person um, we were able to look at this and say, oh, wait a second, this must be this person here, and we're able to identify the person. Um, this is another really special resource, and I've just made a photocopy of it, but this is a letter that uh, was included, it was a time capsule letter that was created by the students of um, the Malaga Cove School in 1941. And in the back of the letter, the students had their own little photographs um, and they put it in the, on the last page of the letter and put their names on it. They probably never thought that this is the way it was going to be used, but this is how research works. Um, and so we're able to find out. We have a Yuao Kadonaga. We have a Hideo Motoike. And sure enough, this is the face of the person who is in the photograph. So we're able to identify people um, that way. Um, so that's, that's, that's been um, a lot of fun, is to try to find the resource um, that would you know, be able to assist us in documenting the people in the photograph. Well, you know, one of the uh, parts that I thought was so exciting about the 1921 directory uh -huh. was that you showed me um, that it showed where they were from in Japan. Uh -huh. So not only was it just the address where they lived here, but also a great resource for knowing where the family had come from. Yeah, so the um, what's interesting about those early directories is they provide a wealth of information. Um, they'll provide what is the economic situation in Los Angeles County? Um, what are the different associations um, that are existing? Um, you know, what are the different um, prefectural interest groups. So, and I think that's what you're referring to is there's one part of the directory that says it's the members of the Kenjinkai of, of a specific prefecture. And Kenjinkai is like friends of the, you know, prefecture. And 
Um, from there, it said that there were uh, 200 members of this group who were members of the Totori Prefecture Kenjinkai. So we know that at the time, in 1921, there were at least 200 people who had an interest. Now, if, that, if they're from Totori or not, we don't know, but we gather that they had a, a must be or had a very strong interest for some reason. And that gives us a way to further the research um, to, try to, find, to try to find people. Um, and that, that is also, um, I go crazy with this because it's so much fun. You can look at naturalization records and in naturalization records, um, it will say where the person was born. Um, and that's gold for us because we can go through and then do a search using a tool like Ancestry.com and find all naturalizations for people in Los Angeles County who had a birthplace of Totori Prefecture and generate a list of family names um, from that and use that against what we already know or to try to fill it in. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what's that we survive, really survive, or what we, we really work a lot with the donations that people make to the local history center. I mean, it makes, it's, it's a document, it's documentation that documents the history of our own community. And, um, you know, having this person docu send this in, it was the daughter-in-law of one of the people who was in the photograph. Um, she is already elderly, but what is she going to do with the photograph? She wanted it to be with us here at the local history center so that we could continue our work. Um, and that is just really special. So we always encourage people when you're looking through your materials, don't pitch it. Um, it might have, um, you know, historic value and local value for us um, when we are documenting our community. Yeah. The other uh, document that we have over here is our Japanese farm locations. And that was something when we were doing our original 40 families, um, we got this from Berkeley uh, and it documents uh, the approximate locations of all of the different farms um, that were on the peninsula. And that is, you know, that's really special because, um, you know, back then, uh, we didn't have a Paseo del Mar, and we don't have specific addresses because the area was, you know, not laid, the roads might have been laid out, but they're not numbered. So we have P.O. boxes for people, um, you know, when we're looking at census records. So having approximate locations of where people are or where they farmed is really helpful for us. Um, you know, it was one of these where, you know, somebody in their oral history or in documentation, they'll say, oh yeah, we were about where farm number two is. Um, and we can look at that and, you know, do a little bit more research on what, well, what was actually happening around that area where farm number two was, was located. Yeah. And I guess this is also, um, um, you know, we get into the, the broader history of Japanese um, and Japanese Americans and their experience um, in California because of course, uh, right before World War II or at, with World War II, our Japanese farming community um, was incarcerated and sent to, uh, in, sent to internment camps, which basically ended our Japanese farming community. Um, so it really points to why we want to document this. It's a community that was here and uh, mostly um, disappeared after the war, um, with very few farmers, you know, a handful of the farmers coming back. Um, so it's, a, you know, the, the documenting that is very important to, to our history. I mean, it provides that, um, that layer of, I think, a very important layer of who we are as a community and where we were. So we work on a number of different projects um, at the same time. Um, projects have various levels of complexity um, that we're working on. This particular project has been going on um, for a number of years uh, through the 40 Families Project. Um, I think that you know, we have a dedicated docent who is here and it's really to his work that we've been able to get as far as we have um, on this project, but he comes every week, several, and now several times a week to do this. Um, so this is a years long project. Michelle and I were actually talking about that that you know, the projects um, do take um, a long time. Um, some of them are, are always continuing. Where we have other projects where we can do the processing, finish it up, um, create a collection guide so that people can see what it is and, and make that collection guide available. 
but this type of research is will continue on for a long period of time. I mean, the, you know, the goal is to identify everybody. Um, we have 99 people, and I think right now we have about 40 people identified. Um, but since the photograph was taken in 1932, um, our population is aging out, and we need to find, um, you know, ways of finding, uh, you know, being able to document them. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then sometimes uh, there'll be a myth or a story about something that's happening on the peninsula. And when we look at our resources, they, as like uh, with um, some of the photographs from this era, um, they're, uh, you know, they're, the, um, they're documented uh, with different information. So we really need to look at and research and see really what would be. Uh, the story behind it, what not necessarily the accurate one, but uh, or or giving um, additional detail to the stories that we hear. Yeah, that's absolutely true. You know, in, in addition to, um, and this is something I would love for everybody to know, in addition to projects like these, we get um, requests all the time from the public. Um, can you help me research this? Um, I am trying to. Uh, you know, get some type of historic designation. Can you help me research uh, this area? Can you help me find the history of my house? Or do you have photographs um, of my house? Can you tell us about our, what, you know, when the city of Rancho Palos Verdes incorporated, what was going on at that time? What was the population of Rancho Palos Verdes when it incorporated in 1973? You know, we get reference questions all the time and we have to, uh, we, we work with that. So that's part of what we do is projects, reference. Um, we also have library school students who are interested in learning about archives. So we mentor them um, as we're doing our work. Um, so we do the whole gamut here uh, in the local history center. We keep statistics on um, who comes in um, and it kind of comes in, in, in waves when we get people. When there is a community issue or something going on, we'll get people coming in um, quite a bit. Um, I have to say one of our biggest times that we get people in here is during the third grade local history projects. Um, students will come in because that's part of the third grade cur curriculum. They need to do a research topic and um, so we have kids coming in, uh, students coming in, they pick a topic and we help them find you know, the different areas of the room. It's like a little treasure hunt for them because many of them are not used to um, you know, working with records uh, and you know, finding something that isn't digital. Um, so that is February, March, April are kind of busy times for us, especially with the third grade local history um, projects. The, the topic of collection development and what we add to our collection is really an important piece um, of what we do. We can't take everything, right? Because not everything, um, first of all, is related to the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And we really need to focus on what is um, going to be historic and what people, um, you know, that has that historic value to it. We do have a collection policy. So um, it's, it's actually a little bit broad, um, but we try to do document or bring in materials that document the, um, the history of the peninsula in some way. So the cultural history, the built history, um, the, our residents, um, we maintain files. So we look at the materials that come in and we say, does this fit with our collection? Um, is it duplicative of something that we already have? Um, if it's a duplicate, then we don't really need it because we already have one. Um, and so we, we kind of uh, look at that as part of our archival, we look at our, through our archive lens and say, uh, yes, we will get people who are interested in researching this. And so we'll, uh, we'll take that material in. Um, Michelle brings an amazing view. Um, her, I, her area is really collection development, that particular area and how we um, can you know increase or um, be more inclusive in our archives and, and are we getting all of the populations? You want to talk about that a little bit? Well, there's so many. Yeah, that um, our collections are wonderful, um, but there are some gaps, and so we're looking to see uh, what stories we have and the kinds of interest that the patrons have, um, and to be able to find collections that would enhance what we have because everyone has their stories and, and sometimes they don't always agree, but we want to be able to, uh, to have people 
know what they are and where they come from and why they have those kinds of ideas so that they can do the research and make their own conclusions. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, one of the things we just talked about this morning was um, we just learned that there was a very well-known local surfer, um, Pat Jacobs, who was a resident in Lunata Bay. I um, mean, he passed away just a month ago, and he, I think he was 90, 91 years old. And it brought, when we did that, we were thinking about Hap Jacobs and his contribution to the surfing history, but it also made us step back and say, wait a second, what do we have in our collection that is documenting the surf history or that community here on the peninsula? So we'll, I, we just said, let's add that to our list of things that we need to start focusing on. So. You know, an event happens and we'll look at it and say, well, wait a second, what do we have on marine land? Or what do we have on that development or on what, whatever, whatever it is? And then we make decisions based on that and what we're seeing uh, as the gap. Just to kind of give you an idea of what we have here in the local history center, I thought I'd just point out some of the, um, some of the areas that we have. Um, right over here, we have our published sources. So, so this is organized just like the Dewey classification system in the circulating collection. Um, but this is specific, this collection here is specific to, um, to local history. Nothing in here circulates, um, so we do have a lot of things in here that aren't duplicated, or that are not duplicated rather, out in the circulating collection. Um, we have a collection of Point Vicente Interpretive Center docent papers, which are extremely popular, especially with the third grade local history center projects. Um, some oral histories, we always keep um, the local newspapers, the Peninsula, uh, magazine, Palos Verdes magazine, we get copies of that. Um, on the back wall over here, we have another one of our really popular collections, which is our yearbook collection. Um, and that's from the various, um, the various high schools and a couple of the intermediate schools. Um, for those people who have been around for a while, you're probably familiar with the Palos Verdes Review and the Palos Verdes Social Review. We keep copies um, of those as well, and those are wonderfully rich with history um, since they cover um, people, and the, especially the Social Review, you really get a good flavor of what, was, what life was like um, from that time period, so from the 60s on. So that's a really fun collection. Um, the black and white boxes over here are photographs. Um, a lot of those have been digitized. In fact, most of them have been digitized and are available on our digital repository, which is at palosverdeshistory.org. And then right next to that, we have um, our telephone directories. And I've already mentioned how crazy I am about telephone directories uh, and how useful they can be. This is where it's really the fun part of the house, where we have our archival collections. Um, everything is housed um, in archival boxes, so that's why you have these, um, these gray boxes. Um, every box, our archival box, also is the materials are housed in acid-free folders. Um, so we are stabilizing the materials and putting, it, um, putting them in here. Um, you might be wondering, how do you know what's in each of these boxes? Well, what we do is we create a collection guide so that we know in box number two of the, of the golf club collection, you'll be able to find um, all of the directories. So um, that's just an example. We'd have to look at the collection guide itself um, to see about that. But this is where all of our collections are and on this side of the wall and on this side, we're actually um, has uh, projects that are currently in process. So it looks a little bit messy, but there is some organization to this mess um, where we bring in materials, we store them here and process them here. Um, another really big part of our collection are our clippings files. We call these our subject and biographical files. So over the years since we have been doing this, and we've been doing this um, at least since the 1940s, um, um, we have clippings files. So these are our subjects. For topics that are of interest or that we think we're going to be referring to, we clip it from the newspaper, we make a photocopy of it, and then we put it inside, the, um, inside these folders. So that if somebody is asking about Ernie Hallett Park, we have a folder on that. Or if somebody is interested in fishing um, or the fire service, fossils and archaeology, hiking trails, which is always a really big topic, um, Hess Park, we have um, subject files where people can come and take a look at that. 
So these are our, these cabinets here are the subject files. And then we also have biographical files. So for instance, we have all of these in here. So we have been keeping these. We clip these from the newspaper, make photocopies, um, and then put them um, in here. Sometimes we just have one sheet. Sometimes if we have a bunch of information on the person, we'll create an actual folder um, individually for that person. And we put them right here. Yes. And how we get along with this um, overall, we also have an old fashioned card catalog, which is probably the funnest part <laughs> um, when people, especially students who are learning about um, the local history room. We use this to find things that we're looking for in the room. So for example, um, the fourth city, we just ran across this. So it says to us, C folder and clippings file, those would be the cabinets over here, Rancho Palos Verdes formation and save our coastline. So this means we have folders on both of these topics so that we can go over there, pick them up, and it gives us a ready reference into this particular topic. So this, we would not be able to live without this. This has not been digitized. This is um, one of the most important resources that we have because it's the key to getting around the room and finding materials in the local history center. We also have our map case. Um, and in our map cases, this is where we, um, we uh, store our maps and oversized materials like posters. Um, we are in the process of inventorying it and, um, and working it through. This first drawer is with the 40 families um, the project. Um, this one here is on um, the, uh, the Palos Verdes project. So this gives you the site selection maps. Um, for when the area was first being subdivided in the 1920s. So we also have this large collection of maps here um, in, in, the, um, in the local history center. Well, that was a lot of fun. Um, we hope that you have enjoyed um, our first uh, episode of this and we look forward to seeing you next time. Um, Let's see, if you want to have more information, if you'd like more information on the local history center, um, please visit pvld forward slash local history. That is actually the local history's landing page. And if you'd like to take a look at our photographs, uh, please visit palosverdeshistory.org. Again, it's palosverdeshistory.org, and that's our digital repository where we're adding things as they're digitized. We look forward to seeing you again, and wasn't that fun? Oh, it was great. Okay. <laughs> great. Now we better clean this up because Trisha, our volunteer and our uh, library school student, needs to be working on her project. See you guys later.